So I'm sure you guys all remember the cube test that I did for the PolySci 3D heat break video. But I do have a little bit of a confession to make. And that confession, it, it's not what you think, but and that confession is that I did make a third cube. And that third cube is right here on the right hand side. And that third cube is the exact same profile for the Ender 3 V3 SE, but, spoiler alert, it was run on my Elegoo Neptune 2. You can see that the quality of that cube, especially on the X axis, is a lot better overall than this cube here that was done on the Ender 3 V3. Now, not, not to knock the Ender 3 V3 SE. It, it, it's a very capable machine. What I'm trying to get at is the difference is that this cube is running on a machine that's got Clipper firmware installed, which now answers everybody's question of, when will I Clipper this machine? Well, the answer to that, ladies and gentlemen, is right now. I actually got the printer.cfg file from the Creality Sonic Pads official new firmware release. I had somebody do some covert and send it to me. And I want to try that out on here using, well, first off, I want to try using my BTT Pad 7, but then I've got some other stuff in the pipeline and I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil it. I can't give every secret away, you know, girls got to have her secrets. So I'm going to install Clipper onto here, and I'm going to run it off of the BTT Pad 7, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how it works. So as it currently stands, there are three printer.cfg files floating around on the internet for the Ender 3 V3 SE. There is the official Sonic Pad version. There's this version from... This guy here, Ox Dead, if you want to call him that. And then there's this version here from Budas Dinaman. And let me just apologize now for that terrible pronunciation. I haven't really dug too far into these two versions just yet, but I'm assuming that they're based off of the same Master CFG, only because the commenting at the top is very similar. The Sonic Pad version does not have any commenting on the top. I've gone through and ran the comment sections here through Google Translate just to de-Chinify them, if you will. And I'm going to I'm going to test out all three configs just to see if one has better features or functionality than the others, but ultimately I'm probably going to wind up creating a hodgepodge of these three and kind of just mashing them together into my own little version. It seems like the two unofficial versions have TMC2209 stepper sections and the official has 2208 so i'm not exactly sure which drivers are really on this board six to one half dozen the other until you start trying to do sensorless homing and the 2208s may or may not have that functionality working so i guess we'll just have to work around and find out because i'd be interested in setting this up for sensorless homing if it's possible just to have something to create more videos with but Ultimately, I just want to get Clipper on here and just see it move. I want to get it in there, do a bed level, get the Z offset, and be on my way. Now, the version from this guy here actually has some additional functionality that he's working on for getting the bed sensor working, strain gauge. Inside the Sonic Pad version, there are custom sections here that pertain to the bed strain gauge, but these are probably custom coded sections that are not released yet officially because Reality has yet to release their version of Clipper. And yes, cue all of the GPL license violations, blah, 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 but that's the story as of right now. There is no official Creality version of Clipper that has been released yet. So these I may have to just kind of take with a grain of salt and just expect them not to work. 
So I've got my BTT Pad 7 fired up, and I'm going to SSH into it. I'm using Windows PowerShell, but you can use Windows Command Prompt, or you can use a program such as Putty to SSH into your device. I'm just going to go SSH BQ at BTT Pad 7, put in my password. And now there's two ways you can get into Make Menu Config. You can do a CD dot slash clipper, and then in the clipper directory, put Make Menu Config, and that'll bring you into the Make Menu Config interface. If you want to do it another way, you go CD back to your main directory, just CD with a tilde, and you can go and use the Kaya script if you have it installed. Go to the advanced menu, number four. Go into build only, number two. And that will also bring you into the make menu config interface. Looking at the unofficial CFG versions right here, under make menu config, we will compile a binary file using the STM32F103 architecture with a 28K bootloader and serial on USART1 PA10 slash PA9. If you want to, you could actually purchase a USB converter that will plug into the screen ribbon cable. And in a case such as that, you would use the USART3 PB11 PB10, and then you could buy the USB adapter off of Slamazon or something like that. And it's usually about 10 bucks. So here I'll go into enable low level. I'm gonna come down to the microcontroller architecture, hit enter, come down to STM32. Make sure that we're selecting on the STM32 F103. I have seen where you have to do this disable SWD at startup for the Giga device, the GD32 variants. So I'll just select that. Bootloader, I'll create a 28K bootloader. There's no information on clock reference, communication interface. We're going to use the USART one. The baud rate shouldn't matter unless you have it specified inside of your printer.cfg. The unofficial versions do not have a specification for it. You can see right here. But the Sonic Pad version has a baud rate right here of 230400. We'll keep the default baud rate the way it is. And if we have any issues with the printer fragging out, we can try forcing this baud rate here into another binary. And we can use that baud rate to check and see if that's going to make a difference. From here, I'll just hit Q for quit. Yes for save the configuration. And we can see right here, it starts building the firmware. If we were just using the make menu config command instead of entering it through Kaya, then we would have to physically type in the word make and hit enter, and it would do the exact same thing you see here. It's going to compile the file. And it's going to call it clipper.bin. We don't have to change any names for this binary file, but if we were to flash a new version of this binary file, we would have to create a binary file with a different name because you can't use the same name twice. Meaning that if you have one version called clipper.bin, you'd have to call the next version clipper1.bin or something like that. You'd have to give it a different name, but then you could revert back to clipper.bin the third time around, if that makes sense. Okay, so I've got that all figured out. Now I'm going to go into WinSCP and I'm going to grab this clipper.bin file. So I'll open WinSCP. I'll start my session to get back into my pad seven. And I'm going to go into my home directory, BQ, Clipper, out, and then clipper.bin. Make sure that the date matches. Yes, it does. So I'll select it, I'll right click, I'll copy. And then over on the left hand side, I've got an SD card plugged in. So I'll hit the drop down here. I'll select the SD card and then I'll hit paste. Hit OK to confirm. And now it puts the binary file onto the SD card. Now I'm going to plug this SD card into the machine, power it up, and that should load the Clipper binary. But if history's told me anything, it's to disconnect the screen before trying to load this binary file or else it won't work very well. So I'm going to start by doing that and then I will insert the card and turn it on. Okay, so I'm going to disconnect the ribbon cable from the back of the screen, which is just a simple matter of wiggling the cable out. Got the binary file right here on this micro SD card inside of an SD adapter. If this one doesn't work, I'm going to try the one that came with the machine. This is a 32 gigata gigata, and I'm not sure what the capacity is on this machine for loading in a binary, so we'll find out. 
So place the card into the slot. Turn it on. And then we'll do the usual we'll wait two minutes and everything should be hunky dory. In the meantime, I'm going to bring the pad seven over and I'm going to plug it in and we're going to check and see if we have communication and all that happy fun stuff. Okay, so I've got the pad seven over here. I don't have it configured just yet. So I'll turn that on. I'll let this boot up again. And then what I have to do is it's set up for the two Elegoo Neptunes and for the Sovol SV07. I'm gonna use the Sovol SV07 printer only because I don't have one anymore. So it leaves me an empty printer slot here. I have to go in and rename it and stuff like that. But for, for the time being, this, this should be fine. So I'm gonna run it off of the Sovol SV07 Plus profile that I have here and it should work with the proper printer CFG. Okay, so I gave it about a minute or so to take the binary file. I turned the machine off, removed the SD card, turned the machine back on. I've got it plugged into the pad seven, so now I should be able to do a preliminary test to make sure that it's connected to the actual USB port and that I'm getting feedback from the device. So I'll go back into an SSH session and I'll just type in LS USB and we can see right here, the Quinhang Electronics CH340 serial converter, that's usually the telltale that your device is attached. It may not say exactly this, but from my experience with MakerBase and their clone boards, if you will, this seems to be the common name that comes up. And we can test that also by commanding ls slash dev slash serial slash by dash path and then star. And we can see right here the by path is the USB port that's on the side of the pad seven because that's what I have it plugged into. So I should be able to copy this path right here. Control C to copy it. I'll go into Windows Notepad. First, I'm going to try using the Sonic Pad printer CFG. I'm going to comment out this baud rate right here. And then the serial section right here, I'll just paste the by path because when you're using multiple instances, you want to use the by path rather than by ID or the catch all of the TTY USB zero. I'm going to put that into the exact same spot on all three of the CFGs. That way I can freely bounce between them and not have to worry why one is popping up and one is not. So I'll just save these just to be on the safe side. Now I'm actually going to let you guys in on a little secret. The reason why I record these videos so I can have something to reference back on when I forget how to do something because I need to reset my config.json file for the SV07 plus because I had it running off of Wi-Fi and I don't remember where the hell the file is. Okay, I got it. It's under BQ main sale config.json. One damn folder I didn't look at. Okay, so the pad seven is up. I've got it set up for the SV07 plus, but again, that's just semantics. I'll go into machine. I'll go into printer.cfg. Now this is the old one for the SV07. So for right now, I'm going to just take that just in case somebody should need it for something. And I will do a create file and I'll say SV07 backup printer.cfg. Create that, go into here, control A, control C, save and close, go to here, paste, save and close. And now I don't feel so bad going into notepad, grabbing everything here, control A, delete, control V, save and restart. Okay, so, so the factory, CFG came up with errors saying that I can't use safety homing and homing override simultaneously. And I believe I uncommented the safety home myself, so I will take full responsibility for that. Okay, now we can start seeing where PR touch v2 is not a valid config section. So, yeah, there is some special trickery going on with these two sections right here. So what I'll do is for now, I'm just going to delete those because I have a backup copy of this CFG. Save and restart. And we're up. So it seems to be working. I just have to go through and make sure everything's set the right way. One thing I could see so far is I have to 
fix that because I like the cross style rather than the buttons. So gonna go to the pad seven and we'll see if this thing's gonna go for a fly or not. So, so far it's been pretty painless getting Clipper installed on here. It, it pretty much installs the exact same way as any other printer would. You compile your bin file, load it into the SD card slot, turn it on, connect the device, make sure you've got USB communication, load the printer.cfg. Eh, sometimes there's a couple little odds and ends there that have to be fixed, but eh, that, that all comes with the territory. So I'm going to try and home it out without kicking my tripod and see what it does. Okay, so we'll go to the SVO7 Plus. And again, there's a couple little things that I have to take care of. I've got to set the G-code path, but I should be able to control the machine from here. I'll just tap on there to get rid of it. It'll move. Home. And I'm going to try doing one at a time. So I'll home X. Okay, so that worked. There are some error messages coming up here. I'm not too happy with that. This is the Sonic Pad config. This should work right out of the box, but eh, well, what's to expect? The nice thing about it, though, is that being that it is the Creality version, if I have to go in and adjust the CFG files from the other guys, I've at least got the pin files that are needed. And my battery just died from my damn light. So how great is that? <laughs> And we're back. So I was playing around with the printer CFG from the Sonic Pad and I wasn't too keen on it. So I figured I'd swap out to one of the other ones from the community and eh, lackluster results, less than stellar. So I kind of started messing around with my own config and I took some of the community stuff. I took some of the Sonic Pad stuff. I took some of my Neptune stuff, kind of sprinkled a little here, sprinkled a little there. And I came up with a workable solution. I've got it to a point now where I can move the machine around. I can home it. Not a lot of fanfare going on here, but you can see that it all is working. I haven't done PID tune yet. I'm going to do PID tune for the nozzle. I'm going to do PID tune for the bed and we'll see what we get. I'm going to uh, bed level and I will make a print. Okay, so I'm in main sale right now, and I've got a bunch of macros that I've added to my printer CFG. If I go into printer CFG, and I do a search for PID, come down, and we'll see I've got a G-code macro for PID underscore nozzle, and a G-code macro for PID underscore bed. Here's where you would set the target for your PID tuning. And typically, you want to keep it somewhere around the temperatures that you wish to use mostly. But I don't know, I, I've, I've found that if I find a good middle ground between my lowest and highest point and just kind of stick with that, I don't really have too much deviation. So I know that with PETG, I usually have my bed at around 70 to 75. And with PLA, I usually have it between 55 and 60. So 65 is a good middle ground. And then same with the nozzle. My PLA prints usually run between 205 and 215. and PETG is typically 235 to 245, so somewhere in between there, two and a quarter, 230, that should be fine. So if I save and restart, just to make sure that the changes take effect, go back to my dashboard, come down, and I'm going to do a PID nozzle. And if you had any errors that pop up, it would show right here. But if we look up, we'll see that the nozzle Temperature is now it's set to 230, and it's going to run through the PID tune. And I won't bore you with all that, so we'll come back when that's finished. Okay, so the nozzle PID tune went through no problem. It saved the config, and now I'm doing the bed tune. Once the bed tune is complete, I have to run the pressure advance test, and I have to do a resonance test for input shaping to make sure that this machine is dialed in at least close enough as my Neptune 2 is. That way I can do an apples to apples comparison between the two machines because they both now have bimetal heat breaks. They're both running clipper firmware and they're both going to have pressure advance and resonance tuning done, PID tuning as well. So we'll see what the results are after all of that is done. 
I'll do a brief capture of each of the tests. I do have to figure out a way to mount the ADXLs that I have onto this machine, but that'll be interesting to see. But once I get that all tuned in, then I can run the same test cube and we'll see what the results look like. Okay, so I figured out where I'm going to mount the ADXL. Typically, the Y axis on these types of machines is easy if you have some bed clips or if you have some binder clips or something like that, because you can use those to kind of pinch the ADXL onto the front of the table. And for the x-axis, it looks like I can get away with affixing something to the top of the fan cover. I think I've got this all figured out. So I have to go into my printer CFG, and I've added the sections that I need for the input shaper. I've got the MCU CB1, the ADXL345 section, the SPI device is set up for 1.1, which is proper for the pad 7. We've got the resonance tester section here with the probe point for the resonance test. And then I've got my input shaper section right here. Inside the console, I should be able to just type in accelerometer underscore query. And we can see right here, the accelerometer is connected and I'm getting a feedback. And much like in my other videos, if we go into the measuring resonance section of the Clipper help documentation, we scroll down. I've already got this stuff installed. So I don't have to worry about any of this. I should be able to let's copy this, paste it in here, change this to Y. Actually, I have to home the machine first. Let me home the machine first. Now that that's done, test my resonance for Y. And don't forget that in Clipper screen, you can also do a calibration through there and it'll just automatically pick the best one for you. But in my case, I'm gonna do it through the console. I'll do it for Y, I'll do it for X. I'll show you the setup for each of them and that'll be it. Then I can go in and do my pressure advanced test. I have a little file that I found that seemed to work pretty well. So I'll print that out and then I'll run the Voron test cube again and we'll see what the results look like. So as far as the actual mounting of the ADXL is concerned, I'm using the Big Tree Tech ADXL, which has these little wings on it. But another benefit to this one is that all the components are surface mount. So you don't have to worry about putting this thing down on anything and shorting it out like you would an ADXL off of Slamazon. So if you just take this, and I've got these bed clips here that I use, and I just take these and I secure the ADXL to the front of the bed with these clips. And then for the x-axis, I use these with these little nylon spacers, put it in like so, and mount it that way. So just as an example, here, and then a bed spacer like this on each side, and then for X, use the smaller one with the nylon. The nylon is going to protect the surface of the PCB. Just put this on top like so, and then use the clip to secure it like that and just use one on each side to keep it from rocking this way. Okay, so now that both of the X and the Y axis have been tested, going to copy this section right here, SSH into the device, right click to paste, and then hit enter. And we can see right here that the recommended input shaper for X is EI at 59.8 Hertz. If we look here, maximum acceleration for X, 5800 and we can see down here that the recommended input shaper for y is the mzv at 36 hertz and the max acceleration is 3800 so i'll go into my printer cfg and because i didn't do the auto tune input shaper i have to put the information here so i'll open the command prompt back up i'll put it side by side so i can read over here and look over here I'll uncomment the input shaper sections here. And I'm going to make the X axis frequency 59.8 with the EI shaper. And the Y will be 36.0 with MZV. Do a search for max excel. We can see right here that the maximum acceleration in this printer CFG is 5000. The input shaper that I'm using says not to go over 3,800. If I wanted to go higher, I could choose a different input shaper. 
I could use the ZV input shaper, which is a little bit more aggressive and get 7,300 out of it. And then same thing with X, I could use the ZV input shaper with 19,000, but we'll stick to what it says here. And I'll use 3,800 as my baseline. And then underneath that, I'll add max X cell to D cell and make that half of the 3,800, which will be 1,900, save and restart. Then if I look at the dashboard, scroll down, we can see right here, the acceleration and the max XL to D cell are what I have set up. Max velocity is 500 millimeters per second and square corner velocity, typically you wanna keep that around five. Now the only thing left to do is the pressure advance test. I don't have any pressure advance set up right here, but chances are I should be able to get a good cube even if I didn't run it, but I'm gonna run the test real quick just to make sure because I want an apples to apples comparison. So let me load up that file and I will print that real quick. Unfortunately, now I can't use the Beagle Cam to take the time lapse. I have to set it up for a time lapse based on a number of sampling seconds or something like that. So it's not gonna be as smooth, but I'll still be able to generate something. So I'll set that all up and we'll come back with the results from the pressure advance test. Okay, pressure advance test has been done. And you can see that the best result happens, give or take about there. I put in the calculation already. I will put that on the screen for anybody who's interested in it. I found this, I think on Thingiverse, and this seems to be a pretty good test piece. But basically what you do is you print this out and you wait for you wait for the quality to, you know, just like the focus on this, you wait for the quality to drop immensely. And then from there, you just measure from the bottom up and kind of ballpark where you want your dimension to be. And then you multiply it by a factor and then you get your pressure advance setting. It's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. But now that that's done, it's time to run the test cube. Now, if you ever have to go for any kind of radiology or imaging or anything like that, I would suggest going for a fatty liver ultrasound, simply because it takes longer to check in than it actually does to take the test. In the time that this part printed, I went, I got the test, I came back. I don't know the results, but I just have to stop eating like I hate myself. But anyway, so the part is done. I haven't taken it off. I haven't even looked at it aside from here. So here are the old cubes. This one is the Neptune 2. This one is PolySci 3D heat break. And this one is the original firmware, original heat break. Here are the results of Clipper firmware, resonance tuning, PolySci 3D heat break, better. Still not perfect. Can still probably use a little bit of additional tuning and a little blob that got stuck to the nozzle as it was printing. But other than that, I'd say it's better. It's not, it's not quite as good as a Neptune 2. Could even be a product of the heat break. It may have to run through the PID tuning again or something or jack up the temperature because I'm not used to using PolySci 3D brake, but let me look at it off camera. And actually looking at it off camera, the Y axis is very consistent to the Neptune 2, maybe a little bit better. And then the X is not as smooth but pretty much, I mean, I would say that they're pretty much on par with each other. 
one definitely seems to have a slight edge over the other, but I'll print out another Voron cube with this filament that I have. This is a PLA Plus. I don't remember the manufacturer, but this is the PLA Plus that I use for one of the parts that I sell on my Etsy page. And if this comes out good, then I'm happy because it's basically the filament that I plan on using. Because what I'll be doing here is I'll be using these for parts for my Etsy product, and I'm going to be printing primarily PETG. So I'm going to have to run some PETG tests on here as well to see exactly how well this holds up to PETG versus my Neptunes. And now here's just a little photo gallery of all the pieces side by side, starting from left and going to right. It's the first part that I made with the standard firmware to standard heat break. The second part was with the PolySci 3D. The third part was the Clipper firmware. And then the fourth one was the Neptune 2. And that's going to be the order of all of these pictures in succession here. Now here we got an overall view again to try and show the, the sidewall lumps and how much better it is with Clipper firmware, comparing the two on the right to the two on the left. And then here's the y-axis. You can see the same thing, some artifacting on the left-hand parts. And then the right-hand parts are a little bit better, less salmon skinning, things like that. So just to recap, in case I forgot to mention anything. To install Clipper onto your Ender 3 V3 SE, the first thing that you'll need is a Clipper bin file that you can get by using the Make Menu Config option inside of Stock Clipper or using the binary burning tool inside of your Sonic Pad. But if you're using Stock Clipper, use the STM32 F103 chip option with the GD32 checkbox marked for the clone chip. Flash the Clipper binary file onto the machine's mainboard by inserting the SD card, removing the stock screen, and turning the printer on. Load the printer.cfg file into your Clipper config through the main sale or fluid web UI, and from there pull out a few hairs while trying to get it to work. This is still a new machine, so there aren't plug-and-play configs available just yet, but your mileage will vary on any printer, so you'll need to learn basic tuning of Clipper firmware regardless of what config you're using anyway, which is part of the fun of Clipper. Always remember to check your Z offset. I did fail to mention this in the video, but I recorded a section on doing it, and all you could see on the Pad 7 was my reflection, so it wasn't worthwhile to put it here. Once that's all finished, set up your resonance tester and run the checks for X and Y. And you don't have to use an ADXL. You can actually run test prints instead, but this is the easier way to do it. If you want sharper corners and smoother seams, always do a pressure advanced test. And once you're done with all of that, run your size calibrations so you can tune in your X, Y, and Z steps. Also, be sure to check your extruder rotation distance if you experience under or over extrusion. And lastly, always read the Clipper help files for information on anything I've covered here. The help documentation is some of the best I've seen, and there's also a plethora of Clipper information available on the internet. So my takeaways are that, for being such a new machine, it is still very easy to install Clipper onto. The printer.cfg is still in early development due to the lack of open-sourced information on the GD32 F303 chip and its pin configuration, so it can be a bit finicky at times. But the community configs and Sonic Pad config do make life a little bit easier. The Clipper binary file can be compiled with Stock Clipper or by using the Sonic Pad, even though Creality's current marketing wank makes it sound like their device is the only one that'll run the Ender 3 V3 SE. The strain gauge isn't officially supported yet with Stock Clipper, so you'll still need to do the paper test for your Z offset, but that does seem to be changing as we speak. The print quality is better than the Stock Marlin system, but that could also be a product of the fact that nobody, including myself, have spent the time seriously dialing in the Marlin firmware. Also, keep in mind that Clipper isn't for everyone. If you watch my Installing Clipper the Easy Way video, you may remember a certain slide about that, and it still rings true to this day. Companies keep trying to bring it into the mainstream, but the fact of the matter is that it's a finicky firmware made for us cantankerous tinkerers, and it will remain that way for some time. And the best thing about Clipper is the quality of life improvements it brings over a comparable Marlin system running a program such as Octoprint. Ever start a print from Octoprint and then look at your control screen? The screen usually has no clue of what's going on with the Marlin system, whereas Clipper screen is right there with you, offering up on-screen status and adjustments you can make mid-print. So that'll about wrap it up for this one. If you liked the video, hit the thumbs up. If you like the channel and you haven't done so yet, please subscribe. And if you know somebody who'd be interested in this type of stuff, share with a friend because sharing is caring. Check out my affiliate links in the description down below at no additional cost to you. It just puts a little bit of catnip into my kitty and it helps my future channel endeavors. 
If you're on that cesspool that is Facebook, join the group, Elegu Neptune Series 3D Printers, Mods, Tweaks, and Improvements, where we offer 24-hour live chats and community support, do the occasional giveaway, and blatantly abuse the everyone tag. But hey, at least we're not a spam fest of 3D artists like those other guys. If you got 30 seconds to burn, check out my website, www.theferalengineer.com. It's just a whole bunch more of the same stuff, but it justifies the 12 bucks a year I spend on the URL. And once again, thank you to all of my catnip contributors, both past, present, and future. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again soon. Blah, 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 bl